So what do you think the hardest part of photography is? Well, I asked my followers on Instagram what they thought, and in this video, I want to share the responses because it's really interesting. Ooh. Morning everybody, fantastic to see you all again. So I put this question out on Instagram last week, just asking my followers what they thought the most difficult thing in photography was, would be. And it was so interesting to see the results. I'm gonna share all the results with you. Now I had some fairly random ones like these, but 80% of people who responded gave a very similar answer. So I thought it'd be good to go through those things that people find difficult and try and explain how you can overcome them. Now it's really interesting actually, you can see I'm on an amazing shoot here, just doing some photography on, in, in the Peak District. And on this journey, I've come across a lot of these same problems and difficulties. The first one being just getting out here and I'll come to that later. But what I'll do is I'll go back to my studio and we can talk about these seven things and I can share some photos and some ideas for how you can overcome them because I'm really sure it'll make a really big difference to your photography. Okay, I'm back in my studio now, so let's go through those seven responses. Before I do it though, I put in the show notes below um, the videos that I think relate to the seven most difficult areas that I've done before because I think I've got a lot of information in previous videos that you probably find quite useful. So I've tried to summarize it there. Okay, so onto the first one, which is the seventh most difficult thing, and that is focus. So people were saying things like, I don't know where to focus, how do I get everything in focus? Where do you focus when you're in woodland? And there was a lot of questions about focus. And it, 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 it's why I did a video on focus about a year ago, I think. Um, and um, I'll link that here. Uh, and it, it is seemingly a difficult thing to do. And I still don't get it right every time, but actually it's fairly easy. And there's a few rules that you can follow to make sure you get everything in focus. Now, the types of shots that I like are like this one here, where everything from the front rocks all the way through to the distant hills is in focus. That's what I think looks the best. The advantage of doing something like that is that the, the lens is working to my advantage. So the first of these rules is just remember that the wider the lens is, the more that you will have in focus. And when you zoom in, so when you go from say a 14 millimeter lens all the way up to a 200 millimeter lens, then the, the, the width of the focus, so what's gonna be in focus from front to back is gonna get narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, so it's gonna be more difficult when you're using a shoot in a 200 millimeter lens to get as much in focus. And it's pretty much impossible if you've got something really close to you to get that in focus and the distant mountains in focus with a 200 millimeter lens. Whereas with a wide angle lens, it's much easier. Okay, the second rule that, that, that's a good one is, think about the mountains. So you, 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 you can get caught up in the hyperfocal distance. So you can get caught up in saying, okay, I wanna focus at the hyperfocal distance. But if you focus slightly closer than that, and some people say a third into the um, scene, but if you focus at the wrong point, and you get too close to that focus point, then you're not gonna have the mountains in focus. And if you think about it, in a, in, a, in a particular landscape shot, then the mountains probably take up a reasonable amount of it, or the hills, or the trees in the background, or whatever. If you really want those to be in focus. So, so my rule tends to be, focus on the mountains, then check where your focus lies. If you need to get a little bit more focus out of it, then focus at twice what your hyperfocal distance is. And you can check apps um, on your phone, like um, photo pills. Okay, the third rule is, is, is a little bit different because it's in woodland. So if you're in woodland, then there's no mountains. And usually what you do is focus on the most prominent tree. So the tree that you want, that you feel is like the, the, the character in, in the scene really. And you wanna focus on that tree and then, then not worry about dropping that focus off a little bit. And you can be a bit creative with it. So sometimes I've shot woodland where I've shot F4, focused on a tree and wanted the background trees to drop out of focus. But usually I'll just let them softly drop and, and they might all be in focus or depending on what focal length I've got or they might just drop off out of focus. But when I'm shooting in the foggy woodland, that doesn't really matter. Okay, 
the sixth point, which again got around about 4% of, of the votes, was just shooting in boring areas, urban areas, inner cities, places where it might be a bit flat or something like that. And you know, people struggled to, to shoot in those areas. Which, which is interesting, I can understand that because if you've not got a big vista like this, then you know, you're going to think, oh, there's nothing to shoot around here. But I believe that there's something to shoot anywhere. So, you know, look at these shots, for instance. So th this, this shot here was taken in New York City, just in Central Park with, with some morning light. This one here was just on the side of a hill. And I've not got the stuff around it, but there was buildings all around here. It was just the side of the hill where I saw this tree. The light was really nice. I got a simplistic shot. Or if you've just got some flat area, maybe just look for a particular tree that's just in a field that might, if the light's right, just work. In fact, I've just thought, sun tree. So one of my favorite shots, this shot here, it looks like it was shot um, in the Far East or something, but it was actually shot not that far away from my house. In fact, what I'll do is I'll go now and show you where I shot it and, and you can see what it looks like. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go now. Okay, so we're here, but I think the tree's gone. I've not been here for about 10 years. So let's have a look. So here you can see, it's actually into the sun at the moment, but so you can see, first of all, that I'm on a main road here. Um, there's nothing really, I mean, this, it's sort of nice, sort of flat land really, and there's some trees over there, but there's nothing really to sort of make you think, wow, this is an amazing landscape location. But can you see those trees over there? There's just like, um, a, Sorry for the lorries going past. Just one second. So the trees over there are sort of the background trees from the shot I took. Tree that was my sun tree, I think it's been chopped down to make way for this show jumping area here. So, oh, that's not good. Can't chop that tree down. That's, <laughs> I don't think anybody can ever take this shot again. But what, what it shows is, that you can find amazing shots anywhere and, and it's more about the conditions and just finding that maybe one thing you think if I if I go back to there and go back to that location when the conditions are amazing then that's going to be so brilliant okay let's go back to the studio so as you can see you know it looks completely different than the actual shot that I got. That was a misty, cold morning. And, um, you know, I'd driven past that tree day after day after day, and I knew one day I'd get a really good good conditions. I can't believe they chopped it down though. That's just like, just seems so wrong. Okay, the next point was time, and people don't have enough time to do landscape photography. I, I can actually completely understand that because landscape photography, can be time consuming, you know, and I often say that you need to take your time when you're doing landscape photography. You've got to go out and spend a few hours in the environment and try and sort of immerse yourself into it to try and feel the environment a little bit. So I can understand that. But I think there's always an ability for people to find time if they, if they want to. You know, if you see it as a relaxing, a relaxing pursuit, then you know, it's good for your health, it's good for your well-being. And what I'd suggest is finding somewhere close by. So if that's just a small woodland, maybe you've got a dog and you can walk your dog um, and just take your camera out and just practice different things, different techniques. The best advice is sunrise really, because I feel sunrise is that, um, that time in the morning that you don't make the most use of. And it's, especially in the summer, you, know, you can get up really early. Now you're not gonna do it every week, but w once or twice getting, getting up at 3 a.m. is not gonna hurt you. And you, know, you can get out, do sunrise and get to work before probably everybody else arrives. I used to do that quite a lot when I worked full time. Um, and you arrive at work at like 7.30, you've done sunrise and you can crack on with your day. What I think is that it's, it's more about motivating yourself to find that time. You know, I got a lot of comments, which was, um, which is sort of the, 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 the other point of this really, which is, getting out of bed was the hardest thing in landscape photography. And it is, there's no doubt about it. 
I, I, you know, when that alarm goes off and you think, oh, I'm going to go all that way, the conditions aren't going to be great, should I do it? Nah, I'm just going to sleep. Um, you know, that's the time that you've got that you just need to grab hold of and just get out there because I guarantee you won't regret it. So about 10% of people said time and about 10% of people said woodland photography was the most difficult part of photography. And this is something that I always used to struggle with, if I'm honest. I, I really wasn't great at it. I've always just been drawn to big vistas and big mountains and waterfalls and, you know, big leading lines going through, you know, seaside shots and things like that. And I sort of shied away from woodland because I never really could get it. But now I'm, you know, if you've seen my Instagram, I've posted more woodland shots than I've posted vistas. I'm, I've really enjoyed it over the summer shooting woodland. And it's funny, really, because woodland is the thing that does take a bit of time. But woodland tends to be the thing that you've got closest by as well. You know, I know that Simon Baxter, Colin Bell have spent huge amount of times in one or two areas just hunting out certain compositions and then maybe going back again and again for years until they've got that perfect shot. So it is important to have somewhere close by to be able to go to to get make the most out of woodland photography. Um, but, you know, th there are opportunities you know, Mass Peter Everson has recently started doing some woodland series that that that, that are really amazing. And I know because I'm, you know, Mass is a friend, and you know he's not done a lot of woodland. He always complains to me there's nothing to shoot in in Denmark. But you know he's gone out there, found some nice woodland. It, it, and it isn't all deciduous. A lot of it is um, plantations, but he's still found really amazing shots in woodland. So you can do it. So the three things I recommend for woodland is. Um, one, use your phone. So go into Woodland and just take away the, the problem of your camera, um, you know, where you've got filters, lenses, you know, you're worrying about settings. Just take your phone and walk around Woodland a few times until you've got a good composition. Then maybe go back with your camera. That's number one. The second one is go back and back and back to the same location. So you start to immerse yourself in it and find new compositions that you might not have seen before. You might go in different lighting conditions and spot something different because woodland changes so much in different light. And then the third one is fog. Fog does make it a lot easier to find a composition in woodland. So just take this for example. What you really need for woodland photography is fog. That's better. It's transformed the scene. So that was from my um, Master in the Art of Landscape Photography course and um, when I was talking about woodland and how to shoot woodland and it just proves just how different a, a woodland scene can become when you've got fog. So the third point was all about locations. So there's two points to this. There's one, finding the location and then planning to go back again and again and again. And I know you can't do that with every location but it does, you know, I'm talking about how to get over those difficult things and going back to the same location definitely helps. Um, and this is a good example. So I was lucky enough when I lived in California to be able to get to Yosemite. And you know these photos here just show you the difference it makes in different lights. So I think the first time I went was this one. This was around about probably 13 years ago. Um, and it was really good conditions. I was really pleased with this shot actually. Then when I went back, when I started to live there, I, I, there was a lot of times when I went like this and it was just this flat light with blue sky and I didn't really get something I wanted that it wasn't quite right. Um, but then I realized that actually, if I went at the right time of day, I got these really good rays of light just coming towards El Cap Capitan on the other side of the valley. So that made a really good black and white with half dome in the distance. And then I finally got the piece of resistance, which was the, the shot I've been looking at, which was this winter Yosemite with the sunset. But it took a lot of times, and I've got lots more shots of Yosemite Valley like this, but it took a lot of time to keep going back to that and understand it, understand how the light interacts with the valley. Um, and the other thing that you've got to remember is that when you get there, you've got to stay in one location and not shoot 20 compositions or try and, go, you know, if you're going to Iceland and shoot 10 different locations, you've got to choose a few locations, two or three a day at most, and go and stay for four or five hours. I've shown this before, but this shot here is one of a series of shots that I took um, when the light just changed completely. So the first one I took was this, then I took this really nice one at sunset, and then I took the shot of the Aurora. I was there for about 14 hours with Mass Peter Everson and we got these good shots um, and I know that he's got some great ones as well 
because we stayed there, we really invested time there and that made such a big difference. Okay, we're down to the top two now and they both got around about 22% of the vote. One of them just tipped it. So the second most difficult was lighting and how you use light and different conditions. And one of the things that I think with this is that people have preconceived ideas that they need to go out in golden light. So you need to have, um, you know, amazing morning light or evening light or the blue hour. And, you know, that's what we all love as landscape photographers. And if you go out and you don't get that, then you sort of fail a little bit. So you need to sort of get away from that preconceived idea. I talked about midday light in this, this video here and it, you know, it amazed me a little bit this summer because I, I embraced it a little bit and I've got some really great shots you know, in midday light. I got a great one in the Lake District, a few great ones in the Lake District, some good ones in the Peak District. And it's about embracing it, I think. So there's three top tips again for, for this and, and light. The first one is having locations that you can go to depending on the light. So for instance, if it's raining, you might want to go into a woodland where you get sort of rich colors. If it's just really drab and overcast and it's really flat light, then maybe that's a good time to go and find a waterfall and shoot a waterfall. You know, if, if it's sunny and, you know, there's fluffy clouds and that's probably a good time to go and shoot a valley of, you know, in the summer where it's all green and you've got dappled light, you know, that, that would work best then. And, and it, by knowing that, knowing locations you can go to, you can adapt your location based on the light conditions and, and then you can make decisions on, on where to go. The second thing is light changes composition. So there's, the third thing is, will help you with this, but the second thing is just to know that light changes composition. And what you want to do is try and understand how light changes composition. So what I'd suggest, and this is the third point really, is find a location that's maybe, you know, just a really nice composition. It might be a wall leading through into the distance, or it might just be a lake or, you know, a nice tree scene that you've got a woodland scene and go and take it in every condition. So take it when it's raining, if it's snowing where you are, then take it when it's snowing, when it's blue sky, morning light, evening light, midday light. Go and take that exact same scene in all those lighting conditions at different times of the year as well. And then just compare them and see how light is interacting with your scene. And you'll definitely, definitely start to improve your photography. Okay. On to the final one, the one that everyone finds most difficult, and I'm sure everyone's guessed it, composition. Yeah, it is definitely the hardest. Uh, it's something that I find the most diff difficult in, in photography, and I, I think every photographer would just say the same. You know, compositions don't just jump out to me. I, it requires a lot of effort and work, and some days are better than others. So I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail because I've talked about it in lots of different videos. Um, the one that I like the most is this video here, and I'll link the others down in the description. But I wanna share three tips because I think there's three things that you can, you can go and do. So the first one is just keep it simple. So what I'd say is remove things from the scene rather than adding them. So if you look at your scene and you think, okay, does that add to the scene? If it doesn't, just try and remove it from the composition. You only want things in that scene that are adding to your composition. And the simpler you can make it, the more powerful that shot will be. The second top tip is balance. So always think about your images in terms of do they balance? So look at them on the screen, look at them on your phone when you've taken them, if, if you're just trying to find a composition and think is there something that's lighter or darker and, and do things just balance in your image. And once you start to do that, it becomes easier and easier to do. And the third thing is just use a longer lens. A longer lens allows you just to focus a little bit tighter in on the scene. And obviously what that does is remove things that, that aren't adding to the scene. It's actually really easy to focus with a wide angle lens, but really a lot more difficult to produce a good composition with a wide angle lens. So what I'd recommend is using a longer lens and just try and focus in on elements of the landscape. And you know, I, I tend to do that if I'm, you know, having a bit of a creative block and I just can't quite find something. I think, okay, I'm gonna get my longer lens out, see what I can find. So good luck with that. Anyway, I hope that's been interesting. It was certainly interesting to me to get everybody's ideas. You know, if you did post um, w w one of the, those on Instagram, then thanks ever so much. If you like this video, then please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, then click the subscribe and don't forget to click that bell icon because believe it or not, I actually am posting videos now midweek from time to time and I don't always do them on the same day. So if you want to get a notification, then click that bell icon. Anyway, that's it for this video and until next Sunday, bye. <laughs>